to it in life, but he also does medicine and healthcare. Cool. So, yeah, he's cool. They've got a group, and they do music when they can. Yes. Yes. Okay, here we go. So, we're just going to go um, from beginning. Is there a way to put in presenter mode? Oh, um, I put some let's notes in there. see. I don't think it actually works with this computer because it's a one-to-one. Uh, okay. -one, uh, oh, could I have this up and just click through oh, yeah. myself? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you just have to click both sides. Yeah, I can do that. But yeah, totally. Well, actually, here, when I on this one, when I present, there's a little button down here that says use presenter mode. Oh, presenter view. Yes. But it also oh, no. is reflected up there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay.
I have sound, or did you turn your sound on? No, I haven't. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> Jump the gun a little bit because there's a rumor that Meg has over 100 slides. So we thought, well, let's get started. I'm excited. All right. So today's Cultural Thursday. We are very lucky to have Meg Foster here. Meg is the daughter of Scott and Sarah Foster. Um, Scott and Sarah traveled to Cuba with me a couple of years ago, and um, I was so excited when Scott or actually maybe it was Meg, maybe, I'm not sure who contacted me and said that Meg had this experience in Russia and was, was interested in talking about it. Um, and so um, Meg is finishing her undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota. She's studying physics and astrophysics and was just accepted into a program down in Oklahoma um, to work on a grad degree. So um, go Meg, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm very excited to be here. I, I was in Russia two years ago, so this will be fun to talk about. Um, yeah, so I was, um, I traveled to Russia. My outline will basically be getting there, talking about the program that I participated in, how I got there, um, where is Moscow, and then I'll talk about living there how I got around, what I did, how I exchanged money, how I got groceries, um, some observations that I made while I was there, and some places that I visited, and lots of pictures and stories. So the program that I was a part of, or applied to, was SPAN, which stands for uh, Student Project for Amity Among Nations. And it was started in 1947 by a group of University of Minnesota students following World War II in the hope that a program like this would um, encourage cross-cultural exchanges among students. And one of the program requirements is to write a 50-page minimum like research slash reflection paper on, on the topic of your choice and what you learned while you were there. So every summer since 1947 this program has selected one to two countries that students can apply to stay at to stay in for the summer and in 2017 the two countries were morocco and russia and studying astronomy and astrophysics i wanted to keep it relevant to my degree and i i thought the space race would be a reason to go to russia so my paper ended up being titled Soviet space race propaganda, the status of women in space and science. And I brought it up here if anybody wants to look at that. Um, so I also wanted to experience another culture. And the reason I wanted to do this program, it was a little longer, it was nine weeks, because it was pretty cost effective to be there for a long time rather than just going for a spring break study abroad or a winter break, study abroad, and global connections, and stuff like that. It was That was my reasoning. And writing the final paper, I knew if I finished that paper, I'd feel proud, and I do. So um, I was there from May 29th to July 31st. And like I said, I was there for sort of a research project. So I was able to visit all these institutions and conduct a number of interviews with women in science and some heads of laboratories and research um, scientists. And I got to go to the um, Russian Academy of Sciences like four times and the Space Research Institute. I had like six interviews there and it was just a fantastic experience. I had about one interview a week, so I had six days a week where I just would go stroll around Moscow and one day a week where I would have an interview. So, so here's, oh, wrong computer. Here's a map of Western Europe and that's where Moscow is. And you can see the, you can notice the concentric circles around Moscow. And I was told that looking for hostels, it would be best, it's safest in the city to be as close to the middle as possible. Um, so being inside those circles is basically where everything is. And um, the population of Moscow actually is about 20 million. 
because in the United States, New York is kind of the financial hub, DC is a political capital, and LA, Las Vegas is entertainment capital, but in Russia, Moscow is the capital of everything. So 20 million people there, it's huge. Um, and I did manage to find a hostel right in the very, very, very center. I was a 20 minute walk from Red Square in the Kremlin and St. Basil's Cathedral. And here's a Google Maps screenshot of Moscow that I thought would be cool to see as well. And right near that pin, I don't know if you can see, but it's also on another ring, which is called um, the Boulevard. And it's, a, it's basically a garden that wraps around all of Moscow. And it's very beautiful. And there's fountains along it. And there's lots of trees, plants. It's really beautiful. So. I got to walk up that every time I headed back to my apartment. And this is the building that I lived in. And you can see it looks like it's four stories, but really there's sort of a fifth story at the top, which is where the hostel was. And behind, over here on the right, is where the boulevard came up. So I would walk up the street from the metro station, and then I'd take a right, right along this edge. And I have a little animation. Oh, not yet. So that's, that's the boulevard right there. And um, that was a metro station. I kind of thought it looked like the Ministry of Magic M. So I took a picture with it. Um, so that was, there was a little garage door. I'd turn around the corner, walk down the sidewalk, another right and another right. And then that was my hostel. And up five flights of stairs. And this was my view, not just from the hostel, nor my bedroom, but from my bed. This was the view from my bed. I couldn't believe it. And that's one of the most well-funded Orthodox churches in the city. And it's got a gold onion on top. And it's just gorgeous to see every day. Um, so I could crawl out there and sit out there. Um, it was just a great view. I spent a lot of time up there. Um, and also. Here's another view where you can see the window cracked open from my bed. Just sitting up in bed, that was what I could see every day. And um, one night the moon was up, so I cracked open my window and took a picture of it. Um, oh, one, oh, it's not very smooth. But the sun rose very early due to the like high latitude of Moscow. and. This bed, of course, was kind of the bed to be in at first because everybody wanted the cool window. But let me tell you, at 9 in the morning, that bed is a greenhouse <laughs> sauna, and you'll wake up sweating. So eventually, it was the bed that nobody really wanted to sleep in. So that's that. Um, some pictures of the hostel that I stayed in. I stayed in the same hostel the whole time, um, except for the one week we traveled to St. Petersburg. Um, and there were these windows all around the hostel, which is so cool. Um, this was it for the kitchen. There was a small refrigerator, and based on travel, different people would come and go through this hostel. We were the, there the longest, the four girls, me and three others who stayed there, and we were there for two months. And some people would come and go for a day, some would stay for a week or two, but everybody shared this refrigerator, so things got tossed quickly, but it was nice to have that and a little freezer. There was also a pressure cooker, which I made like French toast in. That was nice. And a hot water boiler and a panini press, which I ended up making a lot of toast in. But that was it. Nothing else. Um, oh, and a small washing machine that I could pay 150 rubles to do my laundry in, which is about $2. So. But that was it for the hostel. Um, OK, so here's a picture of the metro map in Moscow. And I have to say, this was one of the highlights of my experience was how this is such a well-oiled machine and very well organized. You can see this: the brown ring was line number five. And it's so convenient because you can if you need to get to the other side of the city, it might be faster to just hop off and swing around 
instead of cutting and crossing and transferring. So it was really efficient to get far places. Um, and this is the Metro Trubnaya, was the station that I lived by. And the, the stations are very, very pretty. They have, and this one kind of pales into comparison to the ones I'll show you next, but they all, they were very clean and a lot of artwork was displayed in them. And at the end of the hallway was this sort of mural of Moscow, which you can see it says Moskva, which is how you say Moscow in Russian. Here's another beautiful metro station. Here's another one. This one's very Soviet, in my opinion. <laughs> um, people in all the arches. And I didn't take these pictures, but, and I don't think I got to go to any of these. Um, but one thing that just wowed me was the escalators were massive. And when you walk up the top of them, you basically just see a tunnel going into the earth. And until you're standing on the escalator, do you see the bottom? So they're very, the trains are very deep underground. And there was also a culture on the escalators that if you're going to stand, you stay to the right. If you're going to walk, you go to the left. So even when it was really busy, it would just be half used. Um, another picture of escalators. And this is what it looked like most days because it was so busy. Um, not all the time, but one time I had my arm trapped in a door. And they close hard. They like bounce when they close because they're very... Very hard doors, um, not very forgiving. And I just love the metro system so much that I thought I'd find some facts. Um, that there is 261 metro stations and like 9 million daily riders. So that's a lot. Um, 15 different lines. And depending on where you are, if you're in that number five ring, most of those trains come within one and a half to two minutes. So you don't ever have to wait very long at all. Um, Money-wise, I, I had a $100 Visa gift card to begin with. And I started using that, but then realized I should save that for cases when I don't have cash. So I ended up using the Russian bank Spearbank to exchange money at an ATM. And I would usually get about 8,000 rubles at a time, which was $130, which is as much as the ATM would give me. Um, and a useful number to remember was that $15 was about 1,000 rubles. And I brought some cash and coins up here, if anybody wants to look at them. Um, water, you have to pay for, just like in a lot of other countries. And I had a lot of bone agua water bottles, and I would fill them up every day. And I even brought my own to restaurants sometimes <laughs> because I didn't want to buy water. But it was fine. Um, and then also peanut butter. One time at the hostel, somebody knew there was an American staying at the hostel because who else has peanut butter? That was me. So grocery shopping. This was my favorite grocery store, and it's pronounced Ashan, I think, in Russian. And I didn't take any of the following pictures, but um, so I thought it, I Googled some images of the grocery stores so I could show you what the products look like and also the cost. Um, so that is like a, maybe one liter of milk, and that was 49 rubles. And a dollar was about 70 rubles, depending on the exchange. So a little less than a dollar for milk, uh, cheese. That was like $6 for cheese. I'm a vegetarian, but for anybody curious, <laughs> meat, like a little thing of meat, maybe a dollar twenty, and yogurt. Most mornings I would have like yogurt and granola or toast with peanut butter, but yogurts were like 30 cents, pretty cheap. Overall, I found that food in Moscow was very affordable. And also my, my rent for the whole summer was $528, so not too bad. Um, some popular 
restaurant items are in Russia borscht, which is a beet soup, and I, I'm not a big fan of beet, so I didn't have that frequently. But another favorite, a popular item is honey cake, which I haven't had since I was in Moscow. So if anybody knows a mean honey cake recipe, <laughs> please tell me. Um, also, blini, which, as far as I know, are identical to crepes. I th I somehow think that maybe the only difference is potato flour versus regular flour, but those were delicious and also everywhere. So I had a lot of blini. Also tea and potatoes. And my favorite food was hachapuri, which was this delicious cheesy bread thing that was sold like on, si on like streets everywhere. They were available all over the city, not just in restaurants, but on the street you could buy them and they were delicious. So some observations that I made. Flowers were sold everywhere. And also, I noticed people carrying flowers on the metro, in the city. And I learned that when you visit somebody to somebody's office or house or apartment, it's very customary to bring a gift to them. And flowers, chocolates, candies, any of those things are fine, but flowers are very popular. So you'd see people carrying around one or two flowers all the time. Also bags, men, women, children, everybody had like a satchel. And I believe this is because in Russia, it's illegal to travel without your passport. Every citizen of Moscow or Russia has to travel with their passport on their person. So. That was my rationale, but I assume a lot of people had bags for that reason. But that was something I noticed. Um, also, Adidas tracksuits. And does anybody know what this position is called? <laughs> yeah, Slav squat. So um, I saw lots of that, actually. Lots of people would like smoke in that comfortable position. Um, and there's lots of memes of Slav squats. And I thought this bottom corner was really funny, that on Adidas shoes, the, the stripes are slanted. So when you're sitting in a Slav squat, they line up with the pants. <laughs> so it's just a rumor, but uh, anyway. Also, just pigeons everywhere. Just huge, huge flocks of pigeons. Probably a big city thing, but. So many pigeons. And also smoking. If I smell like smoke, it kind of transports me back to Moscow. Um, but one thing I noticed in particular was the age of people smoking. A lot of young people smoked. And um, one time I was just walking through a park, and there was a group of like 10 boys that had to have been like 12 years old. And they were all smoking. <laughs> and I just. Yeah, so that was a, a big thing that I noticed. And also these scooters. Two years ago, everybody was scootering around, not necessarily electric scooters, but just in the metro, you know, people would be scooting past you and, yeah. Lots of um, street cleaners that were pretty unforgiving when you were in their way. Um, and also construction. So. Moscow hosted the World Cup in 2018, so the summer before, they were beautifying their city big time. And pretty much every sidewalk was being redone, and a lot of building facades were being redone. And I just picture a lot of construction. <laughs> so this was a very accurate view in most parts of town, just a lot of construction, walking on planks around sidewalks. Oh, I wanted to say something when I was talking about metros, that one time I was meeting a woman for an interview. She said, meet me at the middle of such and such station. And I got there, and she was going to be with her eight-year-old son. I thought I should be able to identify this. Um, so I walked up to this woman and her eight-year-old son, and it wasn't the right person. <laughs> so I was a little mortified, but I just went and stood in the middle of the metro station, and patiently waited for a while until another woman and what looked to be an eight-year-old son were also standing there. And it took like five minutes, but eventually I walked over there 
and said, are you Natalia? And she said, yes. Um, but, and then she said her and her son had been trying for the last five minutes to find the American, and they, had uns they were not successful. So that was something I tried not to look, you know, like nobody wore T-shirts. I could count on one hand how many times I saw people wearing T-shirts in Moscow. People dress a lot nice, more nicely, um, and also closed-toed shoes. I wore sandals sometimes, and I was like the only person wearing sandals. So uh, that day I wasn't wearing T-shirts or sandals, so I, I blended in. Also, in addition to the construction making 2017 unique, it was also called the Green Winter because although it was summer and green, it was frigid. It was the coldest Moscow in 150 years. Um, the average high in June was 57, and the average high in July was 64, and it was also the wettest in three decades. So it was cold and rainy and construction-y, but it was fine. Um, the averages are usually in the 70s, so I was kind of bummed, but it's fine. Uh, one other thing that I noticed were just beautiful, large pieces of artwork displayed all around the city. And eventually I started trying to take pictures of them. Um, you know, you could just walk right up and touch them or look at them, but I thought that was a cool, a cool city thing that they did. Some attractions. This is the, um, the Lenin State Library. And I also was meeting a woman here for an interview and I was there like two hours early on just a beautiful day and I was just sitting outside, soaking up the sun on a nice day. And eventually around the time we were supposed to meet, this woman was also kind of hanging around outside on the steps. So I thought, that's Olga. So I walk up to her and I say, hi, are you Olga? And she said, yeah, but I'm not meeting anyone here. <laughs> not the right Olga. <laughs> I also visited the Moscow Cosmonautics Museum many times. It was all in Russian, and they didn't have English translation like audio, so I just went there over and over again and tried to translate stuff, but that was fun. I also went to the Moscow Circus. I didn't take this picture, but it was very impressive. I, was, I thought it was fantastic, and Trubnaya Metro Station, the one that I lived by, was right next to a, a pretty famous circus. And we ended up not going to that one, but we went to another one and it was, it was really cool. Uh, this is the headquarters of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And I can't decide if it's pretty or ugly, <laughs> to be honest, but it was pretty cool. And I had, I had four interviews here. And one time I was being escorted by um, the person who had helped arrange this interview, who worked like on the ninth floor in the earth science department. And she said, don't talk, and I'm going to speak to you in Russian, and you just nod like you can understand while we walk through the security guards. <laughs> and so I did that and made it through. That was nerve-wracking, but fine. I trusted her. Um, this is Goom, which used to be one of the biggest malls in the world. And it's also, it's on the Red Square and very beautiful, very expensive stores in here and very fun to walk around. Yeah, and they're known for their ice cream on the first floor, so. I tried to go here to get my computer fixed because the first week I was in Moscow, I accidentally spilled a cup of tea on my keyboard and actually was computerless the whole summer, which was fine, I actually didn't mind but I couldn't believe that. Um, this is the Space Research Institute that I visited also many times. Huge building, very big, um, yeah. And this is the Yuri Gagarin statue or monument. And Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space launched by the Soviet Union in 1961. And he actually died at the age of 35 in a plane crash. So. He kind of will forever be this young cosmonaut. So I definitely wanted to go, oh, and I'm wearing his shirt today. So yeah. I took a picture right by that. 
And the circle, that sphere down at the bottom, is the size of his capsule that he, that was Vostok 1, which is what he, that's what he flew. He came to Earth in a little ball like that with a parachute. And this is Catherine the Great's palace, and this was unbelievable to visit. Um, gorgeous, very big, and full of gold. Um, that room over there was just the most ornate. No, not, not the most ornate. I'll show you ornate later. <laughs> but, and this was just another park that I went to. This is the owner of the hostel that I stayed at, his dog, and another student from the program uh, who I lived with. And he said that we should go to this park, so he drove us there. And that was like, I don't know, just a beautiful sort of palace thing. And I think it was some ruler lived there. I can't remember. I asked her this morning, but she didn't get back to me. I can't remember what it's called. But we paid a little bit of money to go up there, so we did. And it had great views of the city and the river. And it was just, it was very pretty. And green, another beautiful day. Um, and my, the number of students with me in the group was 10, I believe. And every Saturday, our, we had an advisor come with us. And we were, it was pretty independent. But on Saturdays, he would arrange tours or something like that on, um, for us to go on. And so one of the Saturdays, we went to Novodevichki um, Convent. And it was, this was really pretty. And then we went to the Novodevichki Cemetery, which is a very famous cemetery to be buried in. And it's, I thought it was so pretty. It was very overgrown, not like cemeteries in the United States that are, it's considered respectful to keep them very, very well kept. But here, everything was overgrown. and. There were flowers on different headstones, and I found this cosmonauts. Um, it's not Yuri, but um, it was really pretty. And then we went to Cathedral Square another Saturday. And in the next picture, you'll see how massive some of these buildings are. There's these tiny little people. Um, yeah. And most of most of these things were pretty cheap to go to, um, like five dollars for students to go get tours of all these like palaces. And then, like I mentioned earlier, I lived very close to the center of Moscow, so I would walk to the Kremlin sometimes, and it was like a twenty-minute walk right down to Red Square, which was fun walking along here just people watching and <laughs> observing and yeah here's I didn't take this picture but just a pretty picture of Red Square and you can see the Kremlin wall going around and here's a video I took one day one morning when I was at the this actually I was waiting to see um, Lenin's tomb and it turned out to be not open on Mondays so I was here for like an hour and a half I mostly traveled either alone or with Madeline, um, one other person. And I should also say I don't speak Russian to this day, nor did I when I was there. And I got around fine and felt, felt safe being alone. I felt safe getting around. Um, I tried learning the Cyrillic alphabet at least before I left so I could pronounce things, which was helpful. But in most cases, everything was translated into English. Um, letters at least, not necessarily translated into English, but that was helpful, made it easy to get around. 
Here are just some Google image pictures of Red Square. And St. Basil's Cathedral is this really pretty colorful um, building, which I got to go into. Here's another picture of it. And that's my picture. <laughs> and this is inside. So talk about ornate. It was unbelievable. And the ceilings were extremely high. And these are all icons painted on here. And here's another picture of the outside of the Cosmonautics Museum. The whole museum is underground, and this monument is on top of it with a rocket shooting off into space. This was a day that I just um, kind of walked around the center of Moscow. You can see the financial district, those tall buildings in the background. Um, yeah, just sightseeing. Some pictures of food. <laughs> Lots of pizzas, and actually that pizza-looking thing up there is another version of hachapuri, just a cheesy, bready thing, minus the egg. And the river, Gorky Park is a big, uh, popular park, and there's a lot going on at Gorky Park all the time, concerts and just all sorts of things, so you can see that across in the bottom left-hand picture, don't swim in the river. I didn't, but don't. <laughs> it's nasty. OK, and there's a picture of me standing in front of the, the financial district with my Bonagua water bottle. Um, oh, and here's a video. So my hostel owner also wanted to take Madeline and I to a city a, a couple hours outside of Moscow, which was really cool because Unless you know somebody with a car, it's pretty hard to get out of Moscow. And also, I had heard that traveling 100 miles out of Moscow is like traveling back 100 years in time, because it's just less developed really quickly as you leave Moscow. So here's a video of just the car ride out there. <laughs> Pretty green fields, trees, sunny. And here's some rural Russia streets. And this is the town that we were visiting, and it's called Suzdal. And it has all these very, very old churches that were built in like the 1300s and they've been maintained since then. And actually there was, while we were there, a relic of a 12th century icon was being, was like on tour. So people of the Orthodox faith can go to these churches and visit the relics of these thousand year old icons. So actually I waited in line to go see the, the relics as well. And I also had to wear a headscarf going into any Orthodox churches. And this had this was holy water in here, so people were filling up jugs and drinking out of it. It was me with my <laughs> headscarf on. Um, and then also, there was this beautiful Izmailovskaya park. And I discovered this kind of late in the summer, but was really glad when I did. Very pretty. And a lake that I did see people jumping into. This is where I saw lots of people smoking, too. That was, that was where I saw the little boys smoking. OK, and this is Izmailovskaya Market, and one stop before Izmailovskaya Park. And this is where a lot of, on like Fridays and Saturdays, big like flea market sort of thing where you find your um, Matryoshka dolls, the nesting dolls, and basically all your souvenirs um, from here. But it was very beautiful. And it, I think it used to be like a theme park sort of, or not theme park, but it has this very strong like castle-y theme. And it was amazing. And lots of desserts for sale, sweets, 
This is another thing, like you could bring this to somebody's house if you were visiting. So candy aisles in grocery stores were extremely long. Like candy was everywhere in Moscow. And this is the Moscow State University. I got to just, they had guards. You can't go anywhere inside, but I got to take a picture from afar. And the Dostoevsky House Museum was, we got to go inside and into his house. And, and then the final week we were visited St. Petersburg and we went to Peterhof and went to um, the Peterhof Winter Palace. And behind me in that top left picture is the Gulf of Finland. Um, we took a ferry over. And actually, we took, the, we took a night train from Moscow to St. Petersburg. And then we took the like, bullet train back, which was really fun. It cut the time in half. Um, and that was beautiful. I keep saying that, but it's true. Here was the palace, lots and lots of gold, lots of, lots of gold. And this is what it looks like inside. <laughs> and that's Da Vinci's Madonna and Child when we got to go to an art museum in St. Petersburg. And this is another square in St. Petersburg. And that's our whole group. Also went to a zoo when I was in St. Petersburg. Or not a zoo. <laughs> it was a zoological museum. They were taxidermied animals. OK, and I have to explain this picture. When I went to the part of my interviews, I got to go to the Institute of Medical and Biological Problems, which is uh, a very, very well-respected institution that their goal is to help cosmonauts and astronauts return from space and adjust quickly. So this is actually a zero gravity like sort of thing, but it's actually just like water. And normally the water would be warm. And I'm actually laying on top of the tarp but it's so loose that you just fit underneath it, and then the water pools over you again. So you're kind of in a, you know, you're in equilibrium, and it, it's meant to uh, simulate anti-gravity so they could study bone atrophy. And the longest anybody stayed in one of these was over 50 days. So when I, they were showing me, and they were like, do you, wanna, do you wanna hop in it? And I was like, okay. <laughs> So that was fun. And then the shoes that I'm wearing over there, you strap onto your feet. And these are something that would be on a spaceship that they would, it, um, you sit in a chair and it pumps pressure on the ball of your foot and the heel of your foot and simulates the feeling of walking even when you're sitting. So in space, when you can't walk, you could wear these shoes and your body would kind of remember the feeling of walking. And, perhaps make it easier for you to return to Earth and be able to walk. That was really cool. <laughs> this is a family that I was waiting in line with at Lenin's tomb. They were not from Moscow, and uh, <laughs> they didn't speak English, and I didn't speak Russian, but we took this picture. Um, and then when I was uh, at the, I'll tell you about Lenin's tomb, too. But after I came out, I got to see Yuri Gagarin. He's buried in the Kremlin Wall, which is one of, that's the most honorable place to be buried. Um, here's a picture of the wall. And in the far, it says Yuri Gagarin. Um, oh, I'll tell you about Lenin's tube. So first of all, I, you walk in like one at a time. Um, and then you, the guards kind of like tell you, take a left. And then the people behind me were sort of talking and they were sh shushing them. And you walk down a set of stairs and you're in, you're like inside this building that's full of black, like marbly. It's just dark, very dark and cold. You start walking down stairs and there's guards at every corner, like sh sh telling you to be quiet. And then you round the corner and you can see Lennon's body in this glass box being lit up 
And it was kind of eerie looking because it was so black, the walls, that you could see the light from his body reflecting off of all of the walls. And then you'd walk around him and then exit symmetrically out the other side. And it was just a crazy experience, and, but really cool to see the most well-preserved body in the world. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and this is a really fast time-lapse video of me walking back from the Kremlin to my hostel, taking the trains, though, this time. I got some weird looks holding my phone. <laughs> And then I'll walk up the boulevard. Walk up five flights of stairs. And into my room. <laughs> and that's all. Um, they were about what was the impact of Valentina Tereshkova. The first woman in space was sent by the Soviet Union in 1963. And part of my motivation for the studying that topic was in the, like, how feminism might be different in different cultures. And I thought the first woman in space must have had a big impact on society for like, young girls, kind of like what I imagined would have happened in the United States. And so the interviews were, you know, most of the women I interviewed were in their 50s, 60s, in their 70s. One was in her 90s. And asked them, how did her flight impact you, or did she inspire you to pursue a career in science? And all of them said no. It didn't matter at all. And um, a follow-up question was, if it was really an emancipation of women, that's what, that was part of the propaganda that the Soviet Union was pushing, that this woman was a cosmonaut and look at our, you know, how we've achieved true equality here. Um, but in reality, they didn't follow up by sending another woman out for 19 more years. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to dig deeper into that question and what role did propaganda play in convincing the rest of the world of that. So that, those were, my questions were mostly directed at that kind of a perspective. Yes, the question was what did I ask people in interviews? Yes. Yes, so since the program had been around since 1947, many alumni of the program had started scholarships for students in the future who do similar work that they did, or some people who went just had like a fund for future students. So that I was able to have some financial assistance through that. And um, other than that, just my savings. I think in total it was maybe four grand, including flights. My flight there was $500, and my flight back was 300 So pretty affordable flights. I already forgot to repeat the question. <laughs> OK, yeah. No, and I, I didn't talk to many. OK, I'll repeat the question. Did I discuss the privatization um, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And at first I tried to stay out of politics. Like I, I really didn't know, I didn't know Russian. I had never studied Russian culture or anything before going. So I didn't know enough to ask the right questions really. And yeah, and once I started my topic, I realized a little bit of politics was necessary, but not really considering the 90s and beyond.
Yes. You know, I don't, they did have, I don't even think I saw recycling anywhere, if that's any indicator. Um, pollution, I think, I don't, I don't really, I, that wasn't a question I asked, so I'm not quite sure, but it wasn't the cleanliest. I mean, so I, I don't know in terms of numbers, though, how efficient or careful they are about emissions and gas and pollution. Um, water, we drank out of the tap um, at the hostel, at least. That was filtered clean water. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And actually, Um, the presence of American companies in Russia. Um, I don't remember seeing like tobacco advertisements or things like that, but McDonald's was definitely everywhere and much more popular than McDonald's was KFC. KFC was everywhere and Burger King. KFC and Burger King were much more popular than McDonald's. Yes. Um, I, I didn't watch any TV when I was there. There was a TV in the hostel, but I never watched anything. Uh, I did go to a movie theater one time, and it was Pirates of the Caribbean in Russian, and I didn't understand any of it. Um, um, is, in terms of propaganda, oh, actually, on I was there for, like, I can't remember what day it is, but it was, like, the Russian holiday, like, Russia, I can't remember what it's called, but... Um, no, it's not that. Um, and there were, oh, one day there were massive protests for something, and it was very significant. And we were, I mean, we were told don't participate, of course. Um, I, I don't even remember what it was, but the news completely ignored all the protests. There was no coverage of these protests anywhere on, on broadcasted media. So that's sort of a propaganda thing. Um, I did see a dump truck with Yuri Gagarin's face on it. I took a picture of it. Yes. Another student wrote her paper on that entirely. Actually, two people on that subject. So I don't know much about it, but I, well, I... Before we left, sorry, this is about their healthcare system. Um, it is universal healthcare, and of course, but it's not the best, I think. And I don't know how things are today, but we read a book prior to going to uh, Russia about just about Russia, and healthcare was one of the things in the book. And it talked about in the 80s and 90s how terrible like surgeries were because there wasn't enough funding for like the right type of needles or the right type of gloves and stuff like that. But I don't know how, what that's like today. And then also when I was there, I had a big um, blood burst in my eye and I didn't know what to do. I figured I would just let it go. But my hostel owner said he works at a children's hospital too as a nurse. And he said, 
I'll take a picture of it and send it to the best doctor in Moscow. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and he took a picture of my eye and he said, go get her some of this. And so we went like down the street to this little medical store and he bought me a tube of some drops and it was like 50 rubles for him to go get me that. So that was pretty awesome. Yes. Uh, I, one time when I was on the interstate, was, had to stop on the side of the street. Every car on the interstate had to pull over because apparently Putin was going to drive by in like half an hour. So traffic stopped for like 45 minutes for that. But I, I also didn't really talk much about that. I don't know if I regret that or not, but I think, I don't know, people don't talk much about it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's... Uh, well, the question was, what are people's opinions of Putin? And yeah, I guess I, I hate to say I don't know, <laughs> but I really, yeah. I did witness a little corruption. Um, when I was at my hostel, this is a funny story. They had to make the hostel wheelchair accessible and they had to add ramps to the entryway and to the kitchen um, so they had to do that and they did some installation of these ramps, but it's on the fifth floor of a building with no elevator. So kind of worthless and kind of frustrating, but that's just kind of part of the system of these requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Is there still a flat market for American? Um, no, <laughs> but I don't know if, I'm not sure. Not that I witnessed. I don't know. Yes? Say that again? Yeah, I did see there were um, like old women in rags, like the babushka um, sort of thing and like begging. Um, but some people did say that often, this is so sad, but sometimes the money you give them is given to other people, and other people take that money, and it's kind of organized, um, these beggars. And yeah, but I did see that. Um, not, not as much as I would have expected in such a huge city. Um, maybe like two people a day I would see. Not a lot. Um, but yeah, definitely something I saw. Mm -hmm. Um, I, there were some stray cats, not very many dogs, and our hostel owner had a dog, and I, yeah, I'm, I didn't go to many people's houses. I went to only, like, two other people's houses, and I don't think either of them had pets. Yes. Sure, <laughs> I can do my best. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll kind of explain it with an example that I know. Um, so in 1961, after Yuri Gagarin was launched into space, a group of, a lot of women wanted to fly into space. So in the end, it was these five female spot of females that were like training at the cosmonaut training center and um one of them was like clearly the best and the inside secret is that it was not valentina tereshkova um, who ended up being the first woman in space but valentina tereshkova was perfect for propaganda reasons all the other four women had university degrees in like physics or engineering or math or English. And she was a textile worker from rural Russia whose father had died fighting in a war. 
And so that's a much easier person to propagandize. And so just the, the socialism there was much more about equality and work. Women did a lot of physical labor, like railroad building, conducting trains, and it was, it was a very, like, the communist society of pure equality. And even the idea that the government should raise your children and student or parents would send their kids to, I think it was pronounced Komsomol, which was the Young Communist League, which is, and also Valentina Tereshkova was a secretary of her local Komsomol group. So just the idea that there's a pure equality among all citizens and that everybody is supposed to do their part for the greater good of the Soviet Union. Um, I was warned before I left that I might not be welcomed as an American, and I never felt unwelcome, and um, there were a lot of, there were quite a few tourists, a lot of Chinese tourists. I don't remember seeing in particular like huge groups of American tourists, but I'm sure there were, but definitely at places like the Red Square. Every time I went to the Red Square, there were huge groups of tours and yeah, so definitely a lot of tourism. And one thing, I've never been to New York, but when I was in Moscow, people likened me never being to New York like Moscovites never going to the Red Square. So apparently, if you're from Moscow, it's like a sin to actually visit the Red Square. <laughs> and I was like, do you know like New York is hours and hours and hours away and you live like 15 minutes from the Red Square. Anyway. Yeah. How did you convince your parents to leave? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I think they were a little worried, yeah. But I was raised well and responsible and yeah I think I talk to you guys every day so yes good question um, one my hostel owner um, he, he we mostly I mean, we didn't talk most, like a lot about things, but um, I'm trying to think if anybody asked me or trying to remember questions. Um, most people asked like why I was there. <laughs> um, and I just would explain, oh, it was so hard to convince this one woman. I had to get letters of recommendation from people at the Russian Academy of Sciences written in Russian that I could like read my name in Cyrillic and it was just like this letter about me that was signed and going to be given to somebody else so I could do an interview and some interviews had translators and some didn't but um, it was really hard to convince people why I was there because the concept of just studying abroad is not super common there so yeah, I guess one question was that I got repeatedly was, you know, not in like a interrogation sort of manner, but just, what are you doing here? Because I was there for such an extended amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. English is the international like language of science, so a lot of researchers are have to be trained in English. So most people knew English decently well. Some preferred to speak in Russian, and in every case where they preferred to speak in Russian, I had a translator in person. So I did record all my interviews for purposes of writing my paper, but yeah, the translation was done in person. Mm -hmm. And I had a total of 13 interviews in Moscow, three in St. Petersburg, and three in the United States.
Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I s this is a cell phone that I used. Um, I decided it was just really expensive to have my plan work on my iPhone over there, so I ended up just ditching that for a cheap little phone um, with a SIM card, and I just put money on it when I needed more minutes. That was really slick. And then I could only use my phone when I had Wi-Fi, so the hostel had Wi-Fi, and I broke my computer the first week, so I did not have that. If I needed to work on anything, my roommate let me borrow her computer and I'd use Google Docs to write stuff, but um, I was pretty off the grid. Um, there was a really cool app that you can type in a city and it'll download like a lot of stores and places, and then it's available offline. Um, so I downloaded that, and then if I was ever out and about and needed to get somewhere without maps on my phone, I could use that app. So that was a lifesaver. <laughs> but there were no translation apps that were internet free, so that was, yeah. Um, yeah, some did. Yeah, there were wi not all places, but maybe a quarter had Wi-Fi consistently that worked or had passwords that I could use. Yeah. yeah. The non-scientific people that you Yeah. A lot of, actually, walking on the street, I was asked for directions like 10 times. And I would just say, I still know spasiba, which is thank you, and isvenitia, which is I'm sorry. And those are the only two words I know. And uh, people would walk up to me saying, like, do you know where to get, you know, in Russian? Um, and I, I wouldn't know, but then usually they would just give up on me and go ask somebody else. Um, they definitely, most people like that, I don't think spoke English. Um, but a lot of people my age, younger generation people, definitely were comfortable speaking English. Um, but just, yeah, adults, older, like, I don't know, just uh, fresh out of high school, college people mostly spoke English. Another, a lot of other older adults did speak English as well, um, probably a little bit because they learned it a long time ago. But I was surprised at how well people could carry on, like basic, like hello, um, you know, sort of just people knew English a little bit, but yeah, mostly young people. I don't. Thank you.